9D. How am I doing, Council? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask Larry to uh, join me here because uh, the comments we've prepared, obviously, we did in consultation with our CADIS and uh, their staff have got a lot of the technical expertise uh, behind the uh, remarks that we uh, prepared that we suggest that be submitted to the uh, BDCP agencies on the EIR. And, uh, of course, the, the, the Council, as we said, it's a responsible agency in terms of review in the EIR. You know, that means that the, under CEQA that we're supposed to actively participate in the EIR process. We've been trying to do that, review the draft EIR and the S. And then uh, when we have to make decisions about the project, use the EIR uh, to help inform them. You know, the comments we submit are supposed to be limited to the areas uh, of our jurisdiction. So we've tried to focus our comments to reflect the role of the council as the agency with uh, kind of the big view, the long view, uh, recognizing that the, um, the general direction of the BDCP, many elements of the conservation strategy uh, can help further the objectives of the Reform Act and that the, uh, the plan calls for its successful completion but also recognizing the importance of the measures that are proposed to mitigate impacts so that one of the things we're supposed to do if we're uh, dissatisfied with aspects of the EIR is suggest ways that better mitigation could reduce impacts, uh, suggesting either uh, uh, guidelines or other reference materials that they could use uh, as they select mitigation measures. One of the things that's interesting about the uh, Reform Act's requirements and uh, Vice Chairman Eisenberg raised this earlier in the morning, is the Reform Act has particular requirements for information that are supposed to be in the EIR, not required normally are. And so uh, that's summarized. The, where, where that information can be found is summarized in Appendix 3I of the um, EIR, and we've prepared particular attention to that in our remarks. And if we go through the comments, I can uh, help address those questions. The remaining of the remainder of the comments identify areas where sometimes additional information, but most often just additional analysis could provide, a, we think, a fuller assessment of the environmental impacts of the project or its alternatives. And we've tried to emphasize additional uh, mitigation measures. We've tried to draw on the uh, analysis of the uh, plan that the, BD, that the Arcadis did, as well as the uh, reports from the two science reviews as we uh, did this. Now, Partly we've been able to build on the review of the administrative draft that we did uh, last spring. Uh, we're grateful that the BDCP staff addressed many of those comments. And what we're presenting now are those that remain, as well as a few additionals that uh, we've recognized need some attention as we've reviewed the, the draft EIR now that it's out in the public format. Now, people shouldn't misconstrue our suggestions that there's ways to improve the EIR is some broad criticism of the program, you know, or the IR. There's a tremendous amount of work that's gone into this. I think you've heard how much uh, analysis underlies um, a lot of the uh, provisions that are in the, a lot of the uh, parts of the EIR and the things that are behind it. Um, what we've attached here, uh, in addition to a draft letter, to a cover letter from the council then, uh, would be uh, detailed comments on the EIR and as well as the ISP's comments. And what we're suggesting is that uh, your letter to the um, commenting on the EIR incorporate the ISP's remarks by reference uh, as well as attach them literally to the um, letter that you send in and a request that the um, BDCP agencies, as they respond to our comments, also respond to those uh, of the uh, uh, ISP <laughs> as if we had submitted themsel themselves ourselves. So we've talked about our role in reviewing it, uh, the steps we use to get here. And so I think maybe the first thing to do then, I'm, I'm on page three of our detailed comments, which are almost easiest to find by going to tab item that says agenda 13, and then moving forward in front of that. And the first thing we've done in our remarks is look at appendix 3i to see whether it provides the roadmap and the analysis uh, that the 
Reform Act uh, specifies in terms of unique requirements of EIR. Now, in doing this, you know, we have uh, consulted with our legal staff, but most of the judgments here are about, hey, does this, is this information adequate? It's not really a legal question. It's really about, hey, can we find the information and the analysis? In part, that's because these are unique requirements. We don't have a lot of guidance from prior judgments about this to act upon. Um, I think there's a, among the things we point out is, are some particular uh, things I wanted to bring to your attention. One of the unique requirements of the Reform Act is that the um, alternatives have to be based on a flow criteria, rates of diversion, and operational criteria that in part will identify the water that's required for the ecosystem and the fish, and the BDCP agencies feel they've done that adequately through the effects analysis and the other measures that help them uh, uh, suggest flow criteria and operating provisions for the diversion tunnels, but also that it quantify the water that remains available for export and other beneficial uses. And so far, what the EIR does is it talks about, well, here's how much water we need for the fish and the environment, and so here's how much will be exported. And the law is very clear that it's supposed to identify the water that remains available for export and other beneficial uses. And so that additional piece of the analysis is uh, something that still needs to be developed. And uh, they could do that, we think, through a water balance that examines, you know, how water within the delta and water being exported fits together with the uh, water that's being uh, passed uh, through the delta for ecosystem purposes uh, and uh, overall. The ISB, you've heard about their uh, suggestions about uh, climate change considerations. And we think, again, that can be improved. A lot of the information they need, I think, to provide an adequate analysis is in Appendix 3E of the EIR, but it's not properly reflected in Appendix 3I or elsewhere. Um, one of the unique requirements of the Reform Act in terms of the adequacy of the EIR is that there be it, it evaluate and uh, talk about impacts on Sacramento and San Joaquin River flood management. And again, that's another particular area uh, where we think additional attention would help um, them fulfill the re uh, requirements of the Reform Act for unique contents of the EIR. Um, we've been unable to find a place where they identified the hydraulic impacts associated with construction of the temporary coffer dams that would go into the rivers at the time the diversions are being constructed or where they've assessed the impacts of uh, highway traffic on the, those local roads where the road is atop the levee. And so you might imagine there could be some potential for uh, damage to the levee itself. It's also important that they acknowledge explicitly the connection between conservation measures and the physical parts of the state plan of flood control, a fair portion of uh, the work that would be done in the Yolo Bypass, obviously, in some other locales, uh, alters plan elements of the state plan of flood control, and that needs to be clear. Um, these are comments that have also been echoed in the Central Valley Flood uh, Protection Board's letter that they're previously approved. Another area that needs attention in this portion of the EIR is a response to the requirement in the Reform Act that they had, uh, address the resilience and recovery of the conveyance facilities in the event of catastrophic loss caused by earthquake, flood, or other disaster. And what they've, the analysis that they've provided in this section of the EIR really looks at the risks that uh, con the construction could pose to the integrity of those facilities and doesn't look as well at, hey, what happens in the event of a disaster? What's our recovery strategy? What would we do if there was damage to the levees in the Western Islands that uh, impaired our ability to divert water because of water quality changes? And so those are things, I think, where the information is available and, and just as a question of compiling it and uh, putting it together. And then finally, the analysis of effects of the Delta Conveyance on alternatives on, uh, Delta Conveyance alternatives on water quality. Um, we'll go into that in a minute, but there's areas where it's, again, substantial improvements, we think, in terms of analysis and mitigation measures are helpful. One of the other important things that we think uh, the EIR can do better is assess whether there are any conflicts uh, between the BDCP as proposed and the Delta Plan. Now, when the BDCP, if it's approved by the state and federal agencies and it meets their other requirements of the Reform Act, it will be incorporated to the Delta Plan. And we'll be the ones who have to make sense of that. And that may require some adjustments in the Delta Plan. 
to have the whole package make some kind of sense. And so it's important that in this EIR, if there are those kind of conflicts, they begin to tease those out and help us understand, hey, what, what kind of adjustments might be necessary so that we can really think how these things work together as a total package and provide the kind of assessment uh, that would be important. They do in the plan consider the Delta plan uh, as part of the cumulative impact assessment. And so I think much of that work has been done, but it would be very helpful to go back through and do a more detailed assessment of do they perceive any conflicts between the plan and the proposal they have. You've heard a lot about the uncertainties of of successful outcomes for the bio, uh, conservation measures, uh, the restoration measures. Uh, in the context of the EIR, uh, these conservation activities are mitigation measures that compensate or reduce some of the adverse effects of constructing the conveyance facilities or operating them. And uh, I think you've heard that they're both, it's a very complex system and there's always going to be things we don't understand. Uh, but that as conclusions have been uh, presented, they've tended to, I think the word that was used was um, they, uh, they often take the more, the, the best outcome is the scenario presented in the EIR for what uh, the outcomes of mitigation measures might be. So an analysis that better reflected that uncertainty and especially the uncertainty of the outcomes for tidal marsh restoration. You know, you've heard here, we had a, a testimony from uh, Dr. Herbold a few uh, sessions ago where he reported on one of the uh, seminars that the science program pulled together about the likely benefits of tidal marsh restoration to the deltas pelagic fish. Um, and I think what we heard then was, hey, the tidal marsh restoration can provide a lot of uh, benefits to the <laughs> ecosystem, the wide diversity of fish, mammals, and other other life and um, may provide especially valuable help for uh, animals that are right in the vicinity of the restored site. But areas that are more distant, whether you're going to get benefits from the, that restoration to fish that might be more distant is uncertain. And so uh, that seems to be to be one of the ways in which they, the mitigation package that's proposed now uh, could better reflect the uncertainties that are available. You know, I think you've also heard that one of the reasons for the uncertainties are large are because the restoration measures for those restoration opportunity areas are right now they're just conceptual. You now we could, you know, they tell you there's going to be about here in this area we're going to have restoration that might be between this many acres, you know, this 10,000 and 15,000 acres, and they'll have about this much tidal marsh and about this much riparian habitat, but exactly where, exactly how the pace at which it might occur, none of those details are spelled out. And as we've listened to the reviews of the uh, BDCP, one of the things that I've grown to appreciate is the additional understanding folks have about the tunnels and the diversions because they've actually gotten to a 10% level of design. And through that process of going those extra steps, they've been able to make a number of adjustments that have reduced their environmental impacts, uh, enhanced people's understanding of what, how those projects might operate, and provided some uh, additional assurance to folks who had questions. Uh, that kind of additional planning for the restoration would be helpful, we think. It would help uh, us better understand feasibility of restoration in some areas. It would help us better understand what uh, the potential conflicts there might be with existing land uses and infrastructure and other activities help us better identify mitigation measures within each of those areas. So one of the suggestions that we've got in our, our comments in terms of ways to improve the mitigation would be actually building upon suggestions. One of the re uh, recommendations in the Delta Plan where we recommend that um, for each of the restoration opportunity areas, a landscape scale conceptual model of how the restoration <laughs> would be carried out. Uh, we'd like to build on that and we're suggesting that early in the process of BDCP implementation. Uh, more detailed strategies for restoration in each of those areas ought to be developed that could provide the basis for additional analysis and environmental effects in each area. I think the other elements of that you've heard about uh, uh, in the comments from the science 
board and the um, independent panel that looked at it, one thing that we did during our analysis is uh, we looked back at the pace at which uh, ecosystem restoration actions have been carried out in the valley and in San Francisco Bay. And it's uh, taken much longer in practice uh, to get this work in place than it has uh, than the BDCP is counting on. So it's going to slow the pace at which mitigation measures will be implemented. And so that slower pace ought to be reflected in the analysis. I think that probably covers that one. Yeah, the, another key issue is the um, impacts the water quality. Yeah, one of the things that the um, science panels pointed out is that often the analysis is, uh, reflects uh, the ability of the BDCP to uh, meet targets that are established in the state water quality objectives, but it, those may not reflect always the needs of the species that the um, uh, BDCP is trying to address, so paying a little more attention to those uh, triggers would also be valuable. Uh, you've heard about the importance of addressing San Francisco Bay as an area of potential effect of the BDCP. Uh, this is, you know, on BC, uh, DC and other San Francisco Bay entities are raising this, but it's also important just to the success of the BDCP itself. A number of the species that we're trying to recover are found not just, for example, in Sassoon Marsh, but also over in the San Pablo Baylands. There's a massive restoration program over the, there underway as well to try to recover those same animals. And so we want to make sure that in carrying out this program, we're thinking about the needs of those species across the full ecosystem they use. Uh, and that's especially important with sediment supplies as these areas are opened back up to uh, tidal influence. Sediments will wash up into them to help rebuild the elevations and provide the substrate for tidal marsh. And that's a great thing. The people in San Francisco Bay are already experiencing it, and it's rebuilding elevations in their tidal marshes in ways that help them keep ahead of uh, rising sea levels and dampen the effects of uh, storm surge and whatnot. But we know we're also in a system in which sediment supplies are being reduced. If we start also gaining those sediments to re recover our, site, our tidal marshes, the San Franciscans have reason to worry that there may not be enough available to meet their needs as well. And so a little more analysis of that is especially important. Um, and then there are a, a number of impacts to in Delta water quality that I think are, if I was an in Delta water user, especially an agriculture or a municipal user in the Western Delta, they could trouble me. Um, mitigation measures for those activities are not yet well described. And in some cases, uh, the BDCP acknowledges that decisions have yet to be made about how that should happen. Partly, they've got to spend the time with the folks that are affected to maybe reach agreement on what those issues should be. But it's important that proper mitigation for those impacts be identified in the final EIR rather than have it be deferred. You know, another approach uh, could be to um, set a specific standard that they will meet and recognize that they've got to make some adjustments over time uh, to do that. Um, right now, th those approaches are left too open. And then finally, the, the final set of uh, significant concerns that we raise in our comment letter is about the impacts to the deltas of place. Now, we recognize when the Delta Plan uh, was adopted that yeah, the Delta's got really important values uh, for agriculture, for recreation. He's got uh, unique communities. Uh, it's a very scenic area. It's filled with cultural and historic resources. And our job is to help protect and preserve and enhance those as a change in place. And we recognize that change was probably going to have to occur in the Delta, in part to meet the co-equal goals of ecosystem restoration and water supply reliability. Um, but that pace of that change has to be measured enough that the folks who live in the Delta and the economy they depend on, that they can actually adapt to those changes successfully. And that is in large part about the nature of the mitigation measures that are offered. Uh, so we've uh, talked a little bit about how the programmatic nature of the conservation measures kind of inhibits a uh, full assessment of what those impacts would be. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the BDCP has a, a, 
a less than detailed analysis of the impacts of the restoration actions in the concert in the restoration opportunity areas on agriculture in those areas and that's in part because they're uncertain about how much areas in which locales would be affected uh, in the effects analysis they actually forecast the benefits to fish and wildlife of that restoration based on scenarios of agriculture of conversion and so we think they could use those same scenarios to at least get a ballpark for what the agricultural impacts might be in each area that would be so important in identifying the nature and the magnitude of uh, uh, programmatic conservation measures if we're going to have a program for example to acquire easements to compensate for farmlands let's start to identify early on what the size of that program is going to be how many tens of millions of dollars set it up as a program that can operate in combination with other funds that protect farmland in our in our state uh, rather than try to do it on a parcel by parcel basis uh, there are other ways. you know same thing if there's going to be measures that mitigate the economic effects uh, within the region of um, agriculture's change and the potential environmental uh, related changes that might spin off of those economic effects we could begin to um, put together programs that are more effective than what's outlined in the EIR um, to address those issues if we had a better sense of the scale of those impacts. Uh, one of the things that's not well assessed in the EIR is the potential impacts to recreational boating of one of the kind of second tier below the fold conservation measures, boat inspections for invasive species. And I think we're all thinking, hey, that's a good thing because nobody wants, you know, to have the delta infested with some new muscle. Uh, just because somebody went out water skiing and they hadn't checked their boat for mussels or something. But on the other hand, uh, it's important we right size that. Right now, the, the BDCP suggests I think it's five inspection stations uh, for the Delta, it might be eight. And, um, but we compared it with the, the size of a similar program in Lake Tahoe and tried to adjust for the number of boats that use the two waterways and the number of um, entries to the Delta and uh, we think that they've probably undersized that effect and that would be damaging to recreation and it would also uh, create real problems perhaps for the Delta's uh, tourism economy which is so dependent on boating uh, the construction zone impacts in the uh, of the project if you live near this construction this is going to be a pretty unpleasant period and uh, they could do a better job of conveying what those effects are I think the other agencies have spent more time suggesting how they might be mitigated uh, we've also suggest um, a little more careful assessment of aesthetic impacts there have been a lot of discussion about this recently I think you know if my uh, parks experience and coastal experience we spend a lot of time on these sorts of issues and the important thing to do is think about the impacts as seen from the viewers eyes so a good analysis of what do you see from the road what do you see from the river do that in a way that uses illustrations so that the average uh, reader of the EIR can understand what, what those effects might be and how effective uh, the mitigation might be. I think that's really helpful. We would expect that of a, a project going into our neighborhood often, that there would be some depiction about what it would look like if you saw it from the street. And I think this uh, project along a scenic highway and a heavily used recreation river, similar analysis would be helpful. Again, in many cases, the, the BDCP uh, can do a better job identifying in the EIR now what the adverse, uh, what the mitigation for these adverse effects might be. In some cases, for example, in agricultural mitigation, they have kind of a, a menu of choices that might be applied. It would be helpful to say at a minimum we're going to do this, that, and we're going to do this, and then we might use the other ones as they apply. Uh, in terms of the recreation impacts, we've talked a little bit about the, the boating issues, but in addition, uh, the BDCP during its construction will interfere with recreation in some places. The, uh, the uh, document includes reference to the state parks proposal and suggests they might make a contribution, not describing how big, to help implement some portion of that, uh, listing all six options that were within parks suggestion uh, as things that might get done. Uh, an analysis of those suggestions leads you to realize that three of them can't get done during the period of construction so they don't provide that mitigation a uh, couple of them are really just so far away in terms of their location they wouldn't replace the recreational access that's being lost during the in the construction area and so that's another place where hey let's figure out what you're going to do and do it and in terms of the uh, cultural resources and the historic resources 
I think we can look at other regions, other large uh, projects that actually help uh, not just uh, collect the information from archaeological or historic sites that are disturbed, but go the extra step of working together with local universities and museums and uh, other places to help people understand what they've learned through those processes and uh, kind of build people's recognition of the history and culture in which they live. So, um, you know, and, and again, um, so I think that's, that's the last piece of that that we've talked about there. Um, so those are our, our summary recommendations. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about them. We've offered a, a recommendation to you that's on page 7 of our staff report, including a, a resolution that acknowledges the good work the ISB has done, thanks them for their work, um, directs us to incorporate their letter into the uh, comments that we're submitting, acknowledging that, um, that the uh, CEQA may not always require a, um, use of best available science, but addressing those details will also help them uh, prepare for the uh, Fish and Wildlife's uh, charge of, of using best available science to approve the NCCP if they get to that stage. And then uh, asking you to um, adopt our, uh, uh, asking you to um, authorize the executive officer to send the comments to DWR. So that would be our conclusion. <laughs>